It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to share some of the excitement of the world of ants, bees, and wasps tonight with you. Also some termites for those of you that want to have a bit of a sudden touch because we don't have them in Denmark. So without further ado, let's start this story. What you see here is ants getting food to their nests. They're in Panama, and the reason for doing that is that, if only this thing would work, no it doesn't. The reason for doing that is that they are provisioning an enormous farm. This is how big ant farms can become, and they are all underground. And why can you have a farm underground? Because you're not rearing vegetables, but you're rearing fungi, and those fungi, they use these freshly cut leaf fragments to grow things you can eat as an ant society. And these ants basically have figured it out millions of years ago, and they're among the most impressive societies of insects that we know today. So let's look at what their characteristics are. Farming. We normally think that's something only we can figure out. But here is how the ants do it. They've had so much evolutionary time to work on this that the way they do it these days is they have these assembly line procedures with big workers getting the leaf fragments, smaller workers cutting it into pieces, even smaller workers processing it into the garden. Once these ants had figured out to farm their own food, none of them ever regretted the transition. None of them ever figured out we'd rather go back to hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which is what ants normally do. And that's actually very similar to humans. Once humans had started to build societies and the culture that came with it was based on farming, basically no human society has later split off and made a success of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to go back to. And they made that work because they have extensive caste differentiation. That's a difficult word for just saying division of labor, just like our advanced societies have compared to our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Not only do they have that, they have evolved by natural selection, the equivalent of greenhouse technology and advanced hygiene and waste management. Now what this look like is this. These ants are in South and Central America. So when you take an aerial photograph of the pampas, is this working? No, it isn't. Then you see these kind of islands. Each of them is an ant nest. This is a very dry climate. But the fungi that they rear is basically these gardens are up here. They're all cavities, and the fungus that grows in there needs almost 100% humidity, and these ants evolved in the tropical rainforest. So basically what they did is, after they'd figured out how to build a farm, they could take it out into the dry climate, and with these kind of sophisticated aeration type of channels, they keep constant humidity and constant temperature in their farms, even though the weather outside isn't very favorable. Here below you see their waste management practice, all these red things further down than where the fungus farms are, they're compost heaps. Because if you're a sedentary society, you accumulate a lot of waste, and a lot of waste is giving you infectious diseases. That's what humanity had to cope with after we became sedentary farmers. We got lots of novel diseases, and many came from our domesticated animals. So evolution has somehow built in behaviors in these ants to dig these compost chambers, to work them in such a way that you minimize infection risks. Not only that, they also have antibiotics producing bacteria to control their possible health problems. And they have a very clever solution. They grow them on their own skin. So all this white stuff you see there is a culture of bacteria. 
And these bacteria belong to a specific kind of bacteria that are famous for producing antibiotics. And basically, the ants have done this for millions and millions of years. They've figured out to do it in a sustainable way. They have them in these little crypts. Every little hollow here is a culture of bacteria, and each of them is somehow fed by a little gland that secretes something we don't know what it is and makes these bacteria grow, and they ooze out the antibiotics, and they use them for controlling crop disease, because there's been another fungus that became a parasite on those crops. And quite likely, they haven't really met serious resistance problems, which is more than we can say of our antibiotic use. Because if they had, they would have gone extinct, and we wouldn't have them any longer. Another interesting analogy with our types of societies is that some of the largest farming ants have basically replaced this form of biological control by chemical control. So they evolved large glands that are sitting somewhere here that basically produce chemicals to control disease rather than these bacterial cultures, which for very large societies is an advantage because it's just faster, because you don't have to wait for your bacteria to get in the mood of making your antibiotics. You can just let them flow out. So evolutionary biologists basically, they make pedigree trees. They make evolutionary trees based on DNA markers that reconstruct the history of farming. In a very simplified form, it looks like this. 50 million years ago, the first ant became a farmer. But they were picking up all sorts of fungi from a specific group of fungi. But none of the fungi really specialized in becoming a crop. So that took 30 million years, and it only happened here. Here, one ant basically somehow managed to change its crop fungus, or the fungus mutated to start producing these very special hyphal tips that the ants can clip off and eat and feed to their larvae. And only at this point in time, basically the fungi become specialists, because having something like this only makes sense if you're if you're a crop, if you're a free-living fungus, you don't want to have threats like that. And it's only 10 million years ago that basically, again, a single event turned these ants into the herbivorous ants that I showed you on the first slide, the large-scale defoliator pest ants throughout the Neotropics. So you have a nice sequence going from unspecific unspecialized farming to specialized farming to almost industrious farming. And again, there are some interesting analogy with the way human farming practices evolve. But they look like this. Very small fungus gardens when you sum her up in the tree there at the very beginning. That's how they look today. Here's a quarter dollar coin. And here's these enormous farms that I showed you in the initial slide. And one of them has the mother queen, who is the mom to everybody, and everybody maybe five million workers in a single nest that are all her offspring. So we have super organismic cooperation. Magnificent inf infrastructure, bottom-up coordination through self-organization. Even though we call the mom a queen, she has no power. She doesn't direct anything. She's just an egg-laying machine that is farmed by her daughter workers. There's the vision of labor. There's a public health system, if you want. Keep the colony clean from all sorts of diseases. These colonies are, live up to 20 years, because that's how long these queens last. And just like humans, when we became an efficient industrial farming species, they have a very large ecological footprint, to use a technical term that basically tells you something about how much of the ecosystems you live in you actually turn over. So 
So they're really societies second only to our own, if you think about it. And they've been farming for much longer than we have. And when you compare that to our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, really there's two things you can compare with. You can say the chimpanzees are very intelligent, they're very smart, they're almost as smart as we are. But then at the same time, you need to realize these are still primitive hunter-gatherers. Their group size is about 50, they don't have the vision of labor. So really as society builders, they're pretty hopeless compared to the ants and the termites and the honeybees. So really, these are the two types of societies on Earth that are worth looking at. It's our own and it's those of the ants and the termites. But really, when we go back from the tropics and come down to Denmark or Europe, and you take a wider perspective and you say, we're not only going to look at farming ants, because they are, they are, they are special. But what do we have in terms of insect societies? And really, they come in four types. You have the ants, the termites, the bees, and the wasps. Independently, they've all evolved societies. Some of them very big, some of them relatively modest, and we know all of them, except you don't find termites in Denmark, but bees, bumblebees there, honeybees, yellow jacket wasps, and ants, we have plenty of them. Also, when you take this wider perspective and you look at how good they are, maybe they're not quite as spectacular as the farming ants, but they're really very generally advanced in their architecture. They can do so. I, I've, you've seen this picture in several guys is new. Here's a fungus farming termite nest. We'll get back to that. The termites invented the same trick completely independently. And again, look at the size of this society. This is also in the millions. Here is how honeybees normally live when, before we domesticated them to make honey. They have similarly impressive architecture. Here is a tropical wasp nest that can be about one and a half meter long hanging off a branch. And as I mentioned, the ecological footprint of social insects is tremendous in the tropics, subtropics, and even up to our long-term stable grasslands. If you weigh all the ants, and you weigh all the mammals, then the ants make up more weight than the mammals. And that is because most of the ants are underground and you won't see them. So they turn over a lot of material. So what I hope to achieve tonight, if there's time, is five kind of take-home messages, which are formulated as questions here, and I hope to answer them. And they will all somehow relate to insects' sociality in these advanced societies. Who were the first to invent sperm banks? And did they need freezers? Are practices such as slavery and defense by mercenary soldiers uniquely human? Who were the first to domesticate crops and cattle? What are the overall principles of sustainable disease management and the use of antibiotics? Does every society need a police force to stay stable? So let's have a look how far we can get, because you might have guessed that the answer will be Somehow there's lessons in here that we can take from the insect societies. So let's step even further back. After we've started with farming, then we looked at ants, bees, wasps, and termites. Now we're going to ask ourselves what characterizes a society in general. Now here we go. Cooperation among its members, okay? Division of labor. Provisioning and storage of food, advanced communication, collective defense. These are the kind of things we tend to associate at the plus side of why society is good. We also have some nasty things that characterize societies. Conflict, 
competition, nepotism, policing, punishment that is needed to control that. War and slavery, social parasitism that is exploiting the society without paying your dues, husbandry and agriculture. And then culture, language, art, writing, music, religion, what have you. So, except from the last, we can find examples of all the other things in the ants, the beasts, the wasps, and the termites. And I'll give you a very quick run through what that looked like. So here's a bumblebee society that is a simple one. It lives only for a few months. It has these very basic characteristics of cooperation, division of labor, and food storage in terms of honey and pollen. Here's a big ant nest that I'm staring at in Panama, hanging off a tree. These are very small ants, but they're incre incredibly nasty because they bite. And that is a really efficient collective form of defense. They somehow coordinate that. They communicate by chemical substances to sort of excite each other, and you'd rather get out of their way. Here's an example of a honeybee worker that's inspecting a cell, and there's an egg. And this egg has not been laid by the queen. It's laid by another worker. So it's going to produce a male, a drone, because you can get them from unfertilized eggs. So this is a crime in a honeybee society, because if the division of labor is that mom, queen, does all the egg laying, then workers are not supposed to do that. And even though some workers are tempted to do that because they get more of their genes spread by getting an occasional son of their own rather than leave that to the mom, the other workers don't think that is such a great idea. So this is a policing worker that inspects the egg, smells that it has the wrong smell, and basically removes it. Here's an ant society where there's a contender to the throne. And basically what happens, the breeding female smears her with a chemical, and the result is that she gets beaten up by a number of workers, and she will never make another attempt to be a contender to the throne. So policing, punishment, this has all been studied, and you can find the examples, and the more we look, the more of these examples we find. Here are slave raiders. The red ants, they have jaws that have been become daggers instead of shovels, which ant jaws normally are. So what they do is they raid the neighbors. They kill off all the adult ants. They steal all the larvae and the pupae, bring them to their own nest where they hatch. And they won't know any better than that they belong there. And they will do all the hard labor for their slave masters as long as they live. This has evolved multiple times in multiple subfamilies and genera of ants. This is more familiar to most of you. We know ants are milking aphids, but really it is a form of husbandry. The ants get the secretions of these aphids. It's their excess sugar, and in return, they protect the aphids against predators and infectious diseases very similar to how we keep cattle, sheep, and what have you. And farming. I already showed you this picture, and this is the right moment to say, well, this is what it looks like in ants, but independently, the termites figured out the same type of trick. All the details differ, but they eat fungus as well, and have made a very successful living out of them. So really, it's not only once that we had the evolution of farming systems, but twice. And comparing the two is particularly interesting in them making these analogies with the way we humans do our farming. So here's the Atine Ant system. Here's this man drawn in to give you an idea of the scale of these colonies. One of those fungus gardens there sits that queen that is the mum of everybody. Serious defoliators, I mentioned it already. And here is what termite mounds look like when they have a farm. Somewhere in there, you have this system that looks like this. 
And if you dig further, you find a royal cell where this giant queen sits, which is this egg-laying machine that basically kind of does nothing else the whole day than laying eggs that produces all these tiny workers that keep the society going. And next to her is the king. And when they had their mating flight when they were young, they were the same size. Okay? <laughs> and they still have sex. <laughs> and you can see why they were the same size, because this is what her body looked like originally, but then they were sort of closed up. So that's a major difference between how this works in termites and ants. In the termites, both sex, survive, and they commit in a lifetime matrimony. And in the ants, the males die, and they only survive a stored sperm. And that's what we get to in a moment when I'll tell you about sperm banks. But before we get there, really just to show that farming ants and farming termites are completely separated in the world. So the farming ants evolved here later spread throughout much of Latin America. The farming termites evolved here and later spread to the tropics of the old world. And their origins, I already gave it to you for the ants. Termites are a bit younger, but it's an impressive record. All right, so we have largely answered the middle question there. Who were the first to domesticate crops and cattle? We've kind of looked at this and at least seen that slavery is something that has evolved repeatedly. We will get to mercenaries in a moment, but I first like to take you over to the sperm bank type of thing. Well, you can't read that quite, but what characterizes these societies is they have the absolute most strict form of lifetime monogamy that you can think of. Essentially, sex and society are completely separated. So at the end, you may, some of you may ask me, what can we learn from social insects? Well, I'm not sure I'm going to recommend this. But it's true, and we'll see how that works. Basically, ants and termites have done all the mate choice that they ever do in their life before they make a society. After that, there's nothing left. I already gave you the termite example. Here's that royal cell right in the middle of the colony. There sits that giant queen and her tiny little mate and they're in there for life. If one of them dies, the whole colony dies. Evolution has even made sperm lose their tails. Right? They're sort of amoeboid type of cells that just do the fertilization job. And normally, we think sperm needs tails because they need to swim towards the eggs. And sometimes they need to compete with other sperm. Well, this is what you got with strict lifetime monogamy. You don't need that anymore. <laughs> the ants, the wasps, and the bees have an even less interesting sex life. Because essentially, the males drop dead on the day they do all their mating. And the sperm gets stored in this giant sperm storage organ of the queen. So the upper one is one of those fungus farming ants. This one is a honeybee one. This can keep sperm alive for up to 10 or 20 years. And it's not only alive, it is alive and kicking. It is highly viable. Okay, And if you realize the ants go 100 million years back, it's about twice as long as when they first invented fungus farming, and this operates at ambient temperature. Right? 
So somehow they figured out tricks by having glands that feed that sperm that is dormant without that it takes damage. It's the same principle throughout the bees, the wasps, the ants. It evolved independently because these are not each other's close relatives. They made these advanced societies independently. Nature figured it out, and that's what you have with evolution through natural selection. If you give it time, it will do the most miraculous things for you. So here's how mating works in social insects. We take an ant. And you've seen this, because it happens every year in Copenhagen. You sit in your garden in August, sometimes end of June, and you see all the winged ants come out of their holes. And they do that all at the same time. Because it's some way they signal to each other, probably by volatile chemicals, that now the time has come, we're going to have our big mating party. They all take the air, and mating happens somewhere there. And we don't know exactly how that works. Many of them mate only, queens mate only with a single male, but sometimes they mate with several males all in the same afternoon. And essentially, what you get is that sperm gets transferred from the male organs into the female storage organ. And in this case, I there's three ejaculates, so this queen made it with three males, and that gets stored for life. And this is that big farming queen, and she may live easily 10 years, occasionally 20 years. And she keep fertilizing eggs with that stuff. She will never remate later in life. Because when she gets down, she basically sheds her wings, so she will never be able to fly again because she needs to dig in and wings are useless, and the males drop dead. Okay? <laughs> so this is what you can watch next, next summer. You, you pay attention, right, when this happens, because you can see it. And you realize this ant queen that you see walk around without wings, looking for a place to dig in, she's done all the sex in her life that she'll ever do. Okay, even though most of them will die, but those ones that you really think are a nuisance because they're close to your house, the, they have grown up to full-size colonies and they may be there for 20 years. This is how she digs in, and this is when she's successful and survives, she makes her call. Now, that has a few incredible other consequences. If you never mate later in your life, you have to be very careful. Every sperm is precious. Okay? So this is what a human egg looks like when it gets fertilized. This is what an ant egg looks like when it gets fertilized. One, one sperm went in here, did the fertilization, and it was only one more sperm that hit it because the queen has a kind of a little tap mechanism that basically releases two to five sperm for every egg that comes by and needs to be fertilized. And then you can do the little calculations. How is it possible that she can actually keep fertilizing eggs for 20 years? So here is how it goes. They normally use two to five sperm to fertilize an egg. We've counted how many they store in these big fungus farmers. That's about maximally 450 million. Okay, that's half a billion sperm that she collects on a single afternoon in this organ. And if you realize the standing crop, what they normally have is five million workers. When it's a grown-up colony, workers live about a year. So over a lifetime, she needs to replace them. She needs to produce 20 million workers. Oh, 100 million, sorry. And that is about how the figures match, right? Using two to five sperm. So that is what you call sperm economy. Ant queens keep that stuff stored at ambient temperature 
and they use it very, very prudently. All right, so much for the sperm banks. Let's get back for a little moment to this item because I've given you the slavery, but I haven't given you the mercenaries yet. And for that, we need to draw a few other parallels. This is about defense. This is about being a society. How much of your total resources as a society do you think you want to invest in a standing army? Now, it won't come as a complete surprise if I tell you that depends how big a country you are. Because Holland, where I come from, or Denmark, where most of you are from, our governments would tend to think, hmm, probably we're members of NATO, but we think the Americans can do all that shit of investing in a standing army, and we just give them a few pennies and we contribute a little bit to that, but we really don't take that seriously. Right? And the same is true in ants. So only the species that have the largest colonies have a specialized soldier cast. Workers that are huge and that are only useful for biting and not for doing useful work like digging or nursing the kids. So professional army, also in the social insect world, does not pay off for smaller societies. They use a subscription system. They recruit the normal laborers in times of tension, when they need defenders. So slavery is possible. Is it also possible that some ants, whose societies are normally too small, that they can actually hire foreign soldiers to do the dirty job for them? Well, if you would have asked me three years ago, I would have said, well, this is too crazy to be true. But we actually found an example of that recently and published it. This is a weird system, but it is one of those fungus growers. It's not one of those very big ones, but one of those smaller ones. Peaceful farmers. But some not quite related ants actually evolved to become a parasite of that system. They have some obnoxious alkaloid poisons that they basically use to penetrate this peaceful farming society, and they just dig out a cavity in the fungus garden, that's where they settle down with their little colony. Now, that's a nuisance. That is like a chronic disease to have. But we saw in the field that these things are actually so common that it was a really a puzzle, how can a parasite be so common and not exterminate its host? Because we know lots of other forms of social parasitism like that, but they're always rare. And it turned out this ant has a nomadic raider, a kind of Genghis Khan horde type of ant that comes along and basically eats all the brood, exterminates the fungus god, and kills all the ants. And when you have a specialized enemy like that, it's actually a great idea to have these chronic parasites, because it turns out these chronic parasites rise to the defense of the colonies that have them and beat up these raiders. OK? So we have a very complex situation, an example of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right? So you're infected by a chronic disease, which costs you a number of kitties every year. But if the attacks by this one are frequent enough, at least you live and you have some reproductive success. Whereas colonies that don't have this, basically their likelihood of dying is huge. But it's dependent on context, right? Just one medieval European cities were hiring mercenary soldiers from Switzerland or wherever they got them. Because they only did that in times of crisis, when the option was either you get killed by a raiding army that sweeps through Europe, or you survive and pay these mercenaries. And as soon as a peace treaty was signed, they got a hell 
rid of their mercenaries because they were really expensive. So we have an example of that in the end now too. So I'm reaching the final two questions that I promised you to try and deliver on. What are the ultimate overall principles of sustainable disease management and the use of antibiotics? So we've only been practicing this for a couple of decades. The ants have done this for millions of years, in some systems at least. And there's a good reason for that, because just when we became farmers, started to evolve culture, build cities, get civilizations, we were accumulating a lot of waste, getting a lot of new diseases. Well, so do the ants. Here's the waste heap of one of those big farming ants in Panama. Right, this is old fungus that's no longer useful because it used all its substrate. The dead ants are in there. It's basically a stinking mess. And they put it far away from the colony, downstream, so that the rain doesn't wash it back into this society. And these ants, like all ants, have evolved incredible recognition systems, primarily to recognize each other. We sometimes compare them with barcodes. So these are chemicals they have on the cuticle, and each substance in a gas chromatograph gives a peak. And it's not unlike what you have on the groceries that you buy every week. And so somehow, by their antennae, they can figure out, OK, this ant belongs to my family. Oh, this is a stranger. I'd rather fight her off. But the same type of recognition power basically makes them highly efficient to recognize the first sources of infection that creep in into society and to merciless try to control it even though they have to kill or chase away a number of their own family. So advanced recognition abilities make them really very, very efficient and function as a kind of social immune system, really like if you think about our own bodies, the way our white blood cells patrol our body to try and catch any germ that needs to be eliminated. And the ants are extremely powerful. Again, they've had hundreds of millions of years to figure out the tricks by random mutation and natural selection. They're loaded with glands all over, no matter what you call them, wasps, bees, termites, ants, independently they have evolved the chemical machinery to both communicate but also to control disease. So yes, they are very prudent in doing this. They've learned to use their antibiotics in such a way that basically you don't get resistance problems. For example, an ant society, we've never seen them use antibiotics prophylactically, like the pig industry does, right? They feed pigs with antibiotics just to prevent them getting sick, and so you get more kilos of meat out of your investment. The ants will never do that. So when you, they grow these bacteria on the cuticle that basically allow them to control disease, they basically will only apply them to places where there's a real infection plus that they grow them as living machinery so they can co-evolve. So as soon as they become less efficient, because the target evolves resistance, you get mutations in their cultures to respond to that. Here's my final question. Does every society need a police force to remain stable? And I've given you most of the answers already, so this is mostly to wrap it up. Yes. And there's two things you need to be on guard about when you're an ant or a bee or a wasp or a termite society. One is a social behavior. That's that example of that honeybee policing worker I gave you, because some worker had laid an egg and she wasn't supposed to, so she's reproducing, and that's not in the interest of the rest of the society, so it gets removed. That's a form of reproductive parasitism. And the other is, of course, against any intruder, but 
the pathogens, the bacteria that come into your colony are the biggest challenge because you can't see them. And you need a police system like that, and I gave you already the immune defense type of analogy that operates in their own body. As I said, prophylactic defenses with glandular secretions or with bacterial secretions, homegrown bacteria do not seem to have caused resistance problems. Because as an evolutionary biologist, you can always say, well, if they had, then it would have really been a problem. Those, that species would have gone extinct. It would no longer be with us. So the fact that we have 15,000 or so ant species around on the planet basically means there's 15,000 sustainable solutions of doing your public health system right. Okay? Otherwise, they wouldn't have been here. They are very efficient in many, many ways. And that's really what I had for you. I haven't sort of dwelled on so much what we can learn from them, because I just give you some people that, organizations that fund us, and remember me to say that lots of the stuff I've been telling you is not only my own work, but there's a big center funded by Denmark's Grundforstings Fund behind that, with ESC funding, Marie Reactions, and we do our field work on these farming ants in Panama, hosted by the Smithsonian. So it's really up to you to think about, can we learn something from them? But I give you a few cues, right? Realize that the freedom of an individual ant or honeybee worker is nothing more than the freedom of my skin cells. The only option they have is to be worn down until I shed them because they get renewed from under my skin all the time. Right? Now, that's not exactly the type of society we would fancy for humanity. Right? So when we look at them, it's really we're impressed by infrastructure, by efficiency, by most miraculous types of adaptations like the sperm bank type of analogies. But really, that's like almost the way our ancestors were fascinating by how Hitler could build motorways and other infrastructure. It's not really the type of societies that we'd like to have, and essentially that is because we don't want societies where sex and society are completely separate. Okay? However, it also gives us a lot of dynamics that ants and bees and termites never have. Right? So freedom comes at a price. And I think I'll leave you there because I think that's maybe a good moment to take some questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>